Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We are in our series called By Faith and we're in Hebrews 11, but today I want to steer you towards Genesis 6 because we're gonna read about Noah a little bit today to continue our series by faith. And today I wanna talk to you about belief that obeys. Belief that obeys. And I wanna give you a recap definition of what faith is in Hebrews 11. Uh, The dominant New Testament term for faith is in the Koine Greek word pistis, usually translated faith. And when you see this word faith, especially in Hebrews, chapter 11, it conveys the idea of trust or a firm internal conviction regarding the truthfulness of someone or some claim. So an internal conviction that God is being truthful in what he says he's going to do. And Hebrews 11, uh, in Hebrews 11, faith is man's response to what God has said. It takes seriously the message of God's revealed truth in Holy Scripture. It does not merely agree with God's word, but acts upon it. So that's what faith is in Hebrews 11. It's a confident trust. It's an internal conviction that when God says he's gonna do something, he's gonna do it. Amen? Amen. Guess who gets to find out if that's true or not? Those who step out in faith and obey. We get to find out how true that is. And Noah did. And this is what it says in Hebrews eleven seven, and we'll have it on the screen, and then we're gonna jump to Genesis chapter six. But the NLT version, the New Living Translation, this is what Hebrews 11 says. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before, By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Now don't let that word condemned throw you off. He wasn't being judgmental. I'll explain that later, that his actions condemned the rest of the world, but he wasn't condemning them. The NIV version says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And in the NLT, it says he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, the writer of Hebrews 11 doesn't go into context or detail about Noah's journey and his example of faith. So we need to go into scripture and actually look uh, at that. And so that's why we're gonna go to Genesis 6 and starting with verse 5, we're gonna look at this and and we're not gonna give you the whole story because it actually covers, uh, Noah's story covers uh, chapters six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I just wanna give you a little bit about him having to build this boat and the condition in the world. Uh, when you read this, you may think, wow, this is just like today. Well, I'm gonna connect that as well. Genesis six, verse five. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. Now some people's versions of the Bible say repentant or he repented. Um, God didn't do anything wrong. So the Hebrew meaning there is really to be sorrowful. And I like how the NLT you know, interprets that. It says it broke his heart. To see the world and how evil and sinful it was, how violent it was, It broke God's heart. Do you think God's heart is breaking right now? I think so too. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord, meaning that God had grace or mercy upon him, God saw him and chose to save him and his family to continue human civilization. 
Now, verse nine says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. Now, I just want you to know, blameless does not mean in this Hebrew text, in the original Hebrew, that he was perfect. It's just that his life was marked with more righteous living than it was uh, sinful living. So no one is perfect except for Jesus Christ. We all know that. So he was a blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. That sounds pretty specific, doesn't it? Verse 17, look, once I get his attention, and this is God's way of, of saving Noah and his family, is he needs to build this boat because this flood is real. It's gonna happen. And in order for him to be saved through this judgment. They need to be in this boat. This is their way of being saved. And he says, look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, male and female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground. I have problems with that sometimes. I kind of wish they didn't make it on the boat. Uh, hey, but God knows what he's doing. <laughs> and they'll come to you to be kept alive so the animals would come to them. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah didn't do exactly as he was commanded. No, it says Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Belief that obeys, that's what I wanna focus on today from Noah's story. There's so many lessons that we could cover in this scripture alone, but our subject at hand is Hebrews 11 and the trust in God. And we learned last week also that pisteo in the Greek means to trust in such a way that you will obey. And by the way, belief in God means a conviction that changes the way you live. So if I believe in Jesus, it's not just a, a mindset, an internal or internal intellectual belief that God exists, because even demons believe he exists. But belief is conviction to live a different way. And so same thing here, faith in God's word is to live a different way, hence belief that obeys. What can we learn from Noah's example from 11.7 in Hebrews 11.7? Uh, really simple, really simple points today, um, but so important. And they're simple, but harder to see lived out in your life sometimes, right? Easier said than done kind of moments. Number one, Noah believed God. Noah believed God. It was by faith, it was by belief, internal conviction that God was gonna send a flood. And so he believed this was going to happen. And so Noah got to work with his family and built a large boat. By faith means he believed God was gonna do what he said he was gonna do. Belief must precede obedience. Belief is taking God at his word and believing God to be truthful and God gave Noah a specific plan, so it wasn't like it was this kind of um, random thing that God wanted him to do. It was pretty specific, wasn't it, on what he needed to do. So I kind of feel like that was pretty convincing as well. And I've learned over the years that 
Now follow me on this, because I realize we're in a large room and you won't get to ask a question for clarification. But let me try to explain it the best. I realized over the years that our obedience sometimes tells on us. What I mean is, we'll obey the things that God says to do when we believe him in it. But we don't always believe everything else he says to do. And it shows because we don't act upon it. And I was convicted this week as I was reading this. You know what we tend to do, right? We tend to obey the things that we do believe God's gonna do. But sometimes we don't obey the things, not everything that he's commanded us to do because we're still struggling to believe that. So I think that's an important lesson for us. Can I tell you something? Can I encourage you? God has been faithful every time you've believed and obeyed. What makes you think he's not gonna be faithful again? He will provide. He will protect. And by the way, when we say provide, we don't always mean finances. I get that that's a big issue in people's life. But God will provide people to help the church. God will provide people to help you in life. God will provide shelter. God will provide this. You fill in the blank. God is Jehovah Jireh. We're going to talk more about that with Abraham. He provides. We can trust him and obey. Amen. Amen. I mean, in, in Noah's situation here, it was, it was very unique and very specific, and he chose to believe. We cannot miss that point. And I'm, I'm challenged to look at Scripture again as I read this year through, through the Bible reading plans that we're doing, and I'm challenged to look at things that God has said would happen if we trust him and obey. And I want to go, God, what am I not believing for? I want to believe that in such a way that I'll step out in faith and live it. Amen? I challenge you to do that as a church so we can be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So number two, the obvious next step that, that he had, because belief precedes obedience, belief comes first, conviction that God's gonna do what he says he's gonna do. The second thing that he did is he obeyed. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. The NIV version says, when warned about things not yet seen, it's referring to the flood. The world had never seen a flood like this ever. It's hard to believe something that has never happened, isn't it? It's hard to step out in faith and believe God for something we don't have a frame of reference or someone who did it before you. You can go, yeah, well, it worked for them, so let me go ahead and do this. Noah didn't have any examples. He didn't have a cloud of witnesses to go, I can do this. They did it before me. He had God's word, and then he had specific plans, and then he had to choose to believe and obey. Sometimes God's going to give you something that you don't have all the details, but will you believe that he will do what he says? In fact, let me give you this takeaway. Faith is trusting God even when you don't fully understand. Faith is obeying God even when you don't fully understand. I love what, I love what Christine Kane said. She's a speaker, author, pastor. God requires our obedience before our understanding. Noah didn't have a frame of reference or an idea of what was about to happen. He didn't know exactly how far-reaching this flood was, except God said it would destroy everything on earth, except for the things that would be preserved inside the ark. God requires your obedience before you understand what he's asking you to do completely. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And there are some things that God asks us to do that we go, I have no idea how he's going to make this work out, but Lord, I believe you. And I'm going to step out in faith. And I'm going to step out and obey you and do the next right thing I'm supposed to do. And that's what this chapter is all about. These heroes of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews obey God without seeing what was to come in full. They didn't understand everything, but they trusted and obeyed God. <clears throat> Let me, uh, I, need to, I need to apply something here to this. It's one of those moments where I need you to follow me well and and hear my heart on this. Uh, it's important that we apply this message to our lives the proper way. Because some people will say that God told them to do something or certain things 
but some of those things are not really glorifying God. Or maybe it's more about them and not God. Maybe they're not consistent with scripture or God's nature, or maybe they can be out of order. God, God's telling me to do this. Um, can, I just like, can I just give you a word of caution? I think we need to be careful with that. And let me explain. Let me, well, let me, let me do this first. Let me give you a suggestion. I wanna suggest that we practice believing and trusting God and obeying what's already in here before inventing new things God's telling us to do. I believe that God's gonna whisper something into your ear about something specific that he wants you to do. Trust me, I live that way. But if it's not consistent with his word or his nature and what he can do, you may be hearing a different voice. I'll give you a scriptural example. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. This scripture has inspired churches and organizations to start food pantries, okay? This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, amen. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, not just with our words, but with actions and in truth. Now that scripture has inspired many Christians to help people in physical need, whether it's food, finances, shelter. When people come to our church, this drives us to help them because when we see a brother or sister in need, we wanna help them. We don't wanna just say, oh, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. We want to follow through and act on that and take care of that need as much as we can and as long as they're being honest and real with us as well with all the situations, right? Because we wanna be good stewards of the finances of our church. <clears throat> but here's the thing. The word of God already taught us to do that and showed us to do that. Now, God will get specific and say, I want you to build a food pantry to do that. And guess what? That's what we did over 30 years ago. So the word of God already tells us what to do and then God gets a little specific on the context of the day you're living in. So if anyone says that they need to build a boat, a large boat for everyone to get in to be safe today, you know that's false, right? Why? Because God promised he would never flood the earth again. You see what I'm saying now? We need to check what we're hearing God asking us to do to make sure it's consistent with the parameters and the boundaries of scripture and God's nature. Are you following me? Praise the Lord. And just so you know, Noah was righteous and walked closely with God. You know what that means? Before God asked him to do something crazy, impossible, and outside of his thinking, he was already obeying God in the small things. He was already believing God and obeying God in the small things because he was a righteous man who walked closely with God. He was blameless. This means that when, when Noah was asked to do this big task, he was ready for it because he already saw God being faithful in every other area of his life. What I wanna encourage you to do, I wanna encourage you to make sure you're being faithful to God in the small things so when he does ask you to do something big for his kingdom, you're ready to say yes. And you'll have the faith to do it. Are we following me on that? I wanna make sure not to offend anyone. Because look, we, we know that God has put on people's hearts to do big things and amazing things for his kingdom. But man, sometimes I'll, I'll run into some people, and this has happened many times over the years, where God would tell them to do something pretty radical, and now they're in poverty, and now we, the church, have to help them. That's not exactly, I think, what God, I don't think God meant for you to go in poverty to help someone else so that now everyone else has to help you. So we gotta make sure we're hearing God's, God correctly. And God wants us to be a good stewards with our things and our belongings. God wants us, as men of God, as, as leaders of the home, God wants us to take care of our homes financially. God wants to do all those things. So to, to, to say that God said you're supposed to sell all your things 
and go do something, I want you to double check on that and make sure that is something in scripture or consistent with God and maybe even seek counsel on that. So I hope we're following me okay, amen? Okay, very good. So to wrap up, Noah obeyed God. And by the way, Noah got specific instructions here, didn't he? So it wasn't like, hey, I'm gonna just get rid of everything and just kind of see where the wind takes me. Let's hit Route 66. <laughs> that is not at all. <laughs> that's, that's, that's dangerous. God has plans for your life. Maybe we need to seek that first. Let's take some time to settle down and seek God's will for your life. And then, like I said, let's walk closely with him and do what he already said to do in his revealed will. You know what he said to do, right? Love him, love others, and make disciples, which means reach the lost and help them grow closer to Jesus. We know that God's already told us to do those three things. So let's do those three things, amen? Amen, I'm glad we're in agreement. If faith is trust in God, then obedience is the proof, isn't it? If faith is I trust God, then obedience is the proof. That one hurt when I wrote that one down for myself. He built that boat. Never seen anyone do it. Now, now, now we have a museum now in Kentucky, everyone knows, right? But no flood like that ever again, and it never will happen again. And God gave us a symbol that would be in the sky when it rains. What is that symbol? A rainbow. Every time we see that, we can remember the promise of God and that he keeps his promises, amen? Amen, that's God's symbol, by the way. That's God's symbol. Thirdly, I don't want us to miss this point. Noah saved his family. I mean, it literally says that he built this boat to save his family. There is nothing wrong with that, is there? He built the boat because he loves God and those who love him do what? Obey him. He also loves his family. And when I read this, it, it hit me as a father. And dads, I want to talk to you for a moment. We need you. We need you to be leaders in the home. We need you to increase in faith, to believe God's word and obey. We need men of God who are gonna lead their families, their wives and their children and show their family what it looks like to be heroes of faith, what it looks like to show the faithfulness of God. I just, I am so grateful for my father and my mother because they believed God's word and took him at his word. They obeyed God and I got to watch God show up again and again in my home. <clears throat> you know, I can't deny God's existence. I can't deny God's faithfulness. Sometimes I'll start to wonder, right? Sometimes you get, you're going through some storms and some trials and you kind of go, God, where are you? But I can't deny that God is real and he's faithful. I watched it in my home as a kid. <laughs> Amen. Now, I'm not saying that, <clears throat> I'm not saying that, Dad, your faith is credited to everyone else in the home. That's not how the gospel works. Everyone must believe in Jesus in your home to be saved. But your faith points your family to God. Your faith in God will help your family see God is real and believe in God and trust God and obey him. So men, let's do it. Let's believe. Let's obey. And let's do our best to lead our family to God. And ladies, single mothers, I applaud you. I applaud you. You have to be strong and play two roles in your home. And I know that God will fill that role in your life. I just wanna encourage you with that. God is helping. You also are women of faith. We're gonna read about women of faith in this. Continue to live by faith as a mom and watch God work, watch God work, amen. And then we see in the scripture, lastly in verse seven, 
Noah was declared righteous. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, Noah wasn't condemning people and judging them and hurting them and hating on them. His faith and his obedience proved there is righteousness in a wicked world. At that time, it was so wicked. And his faith and obedience proved that God was telling the truth about a flood and that God keeps his promises. So in other words, his faith glorified God. But everyone who did not believe, they were condemned. They were going to be destroyed. And now, God was right even if Noah didn't. You know what I'm saying, right? God was right and truthful and righteous even if Noah didn't. But for mankind to believe God at his word and obey, his life showed that they needed to, to believe and obey as well, and they didn't. And just so you know, Peter in his writings in the epistles, Peter says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, we don't see that in Genesis 6 through 10, but what that tells us is through Jewish tradition of some sort, we know that Noah preached about God and preached righteousness to the people around him. No one else believed, just him and his family, just so you know. And so when he obeyed, God rewarded him because what does the word say in the beginning of Hebrews 11? He rewards those who earnestly seek him, who walk closely with him. And so because of that, they were condemned to die because they did not believe. That's all it means. So sometimes if you don't read that with a context, you may misunderstand. So how do we apply this today? How do we apply this today? Because, you know, we don't need another boat to be saved because God already said that, well, he'll never flood the earth again. But there is a lot of forward pointing to Jesus in this story. And if you will, I would like to use the ark analogy to say Jesus is our ark. <clears throat> Jesus is our ark. Today, the gospel says to believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will be spared from the coming judgment and wrath that's coming upon all those who do not believe. In fact, John 3, 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. So that just goes right to the whole story with, with Noah condemning them because of his actions he believed. Those who, those who don't believe are condemning themselves, in other words, because they don't trust God at his word and obey him and put their faith in them. So secondly, if Jesus is our ark and there, that means there must be another day of judgment coming, isn't there? And it's not the judgment of, of water, but it will be a fire and destruction on this land and around the world. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24. I wanna go to it because if you believe that Jesus is your ark, you probably also believe that judgment is coming <clears throat> on all people who do not believe in God, right? And this is what Jesus says in, in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. By the way, people will argue, hey, that story's fake. That's a little exaggeration. That's a fable. Well, one of the strong arguments for us when it comes to biblical interpretation is that Jesus claimed the story of Noah as it was a literal event in the Greek understanding of the text. So when Jesus talks about Noah, he talks about it like it wasn't a fake story, but it was a real event that took place. And this is what he says in verse 37. When the Son of Man returns, referring to Jesus, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Does it sound like today? 
You see, Noah preached, Noah warned, no one listened, except for Noah and his family. And all those people were destroyed. It's the same thing about to happen in our world today. People have tuned their ears off. They've turned them off from God. They won't listen to preachers like me. They won't listen to churches. And there's a a variety of reasons why. But let me tell you something. You can't stop what's coming. The only thing you can do is be ready and get in the ark. And that is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now I know you I know if you're a brand new believer or maybe you're a little bit of a skeptic here in this room you're wondering why are we clapping about people's destruction or not We're very concerned We don't want people to perish near to God What we're clapping about is is that God is going to save us from this wretched world and we want everyone we possibly can to get into the boat of Christ Amen <clears throat> Now, that's my third point here in application today. You may not be called to, uh, to build a boat, but we are called to build the kingdom of God. Noah's story points to our responsibility as a church. We are called to get as many people in Christ as we can before this judgment comes. Do you believe that? So belief that obeys. The, the, the great command of making disciples is one of the most neglected commands in the Bible. We believe that we're supposed to lead people to Christ. We believe we're supposed to build the church. We're supposed to get people ready. It's one of the most neglected commands of Christ. Some people call it the great omission because we don't commit it at all. It's called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I command you, and I will be with you. There's the promise. I will be with you until the very end of the age. If we believe that, my friends, you can have faith today that when you obey this command to lead people to Jesus, he is going to help you do it. He is gonna help you do it. Listen, I I didn't go through a 10-step training program on how to love someone. I read the Bible. I learned from Jesus how to love. I learned from Jesus what to say. I learned from the epistles and the apostles. What should I say to my friends? What should I pray? The Holy Spirit taught me to teach people about Jesus. I mean, this is a great church, and I did a whole sermon series about uh, making him known in the summertime. I did that on purpose to equip us for the school year and the new year, and we might need to go back to that. But I'm telling you, I'm gonna encourage you. Do not think you can't lead someone to the Lord. You can. You can. God promised his presence with us for that task. If we believe it, we'll obey it. You Guess what? You don't have to spend time building a boat. You get to build relationships with people and lead them to the Lord. You know, Jesus came to this earth to build a relationship with you, and he did a really good job. And all those who believe that have, have that relationship. Well, God wants us to build a relationship with the lost and help them be saved. He's going to help you do it, I promise you. And lastly, simple as this from this sermon, we are called to trust and obey God. Our feet got to hit the pavement. If we believe it, we got to do it. Noah did. He did it. I got to give him props. He built that boat, didn't he? With the Lord's help. With the Lord's help. And by the way, if you read it again, it says the animals, God brought the animals to him. And it also says that God closed the door on the ark. Noah couldn't do that. That thing was huge. What does that tell me? God is with you when you do his kingdom work. God's gonna see it through. He's gonna help you complete it. 
until it's finished. He's not done with you. He's not done with your task. He is not done with the church. The church must build the kingdom of God. We must fill the kingdom with souls. That's storing up treasures in heaven instead of earth. That's what that means. I can tell you're receiving this. Thank you for that. Let me tell you what St. Ignatius once said. It's not hard to obey when we love the one whom we obey. You know, it takes time to believe. It takes time to grow in that faith. It takes time to obey. It does. It takes steps of faith and obedience to grow. But I'm telling you, I also have grown in my love for God, and it's much easier. It's much easier to obey and believe when you know how much God loves you. And that's my last point. It's a joy to obey when we believe and know how much God loves us. Do you you know how much God loves you? He loves you this much on the cross. I know there's a book that says, from the moon and back. It's a cute book. I used to read it to my kids. Now we say, he loves you eternity. That's what we used to say to our kids. He loves you forever. God loves you. If he's asking you to do the things in the word of God, it's because he loves you. It's a lot easier when you grow in your love for him to do what he says. And we do that through experience of relationship with him. I'm gonna close in prayer. I don't know what God is is convicting or encouraging or inspiring you to build today, but I gotta tell you, I I thank God that, that we believed that we believed God's prompting to purchase the furniture store, which is now our Calvary Community Center. You know, the reason why we built that furniture store is because God said, or that we purchased that furniture store is because God said to take care of the needs of our community. And little did we know that our school would explode with tons of people wanting to come to it, tons of families and students. And we got so full in this facility and we also used Christ Memorial across the street that years ago we had to go into into the community center for our high school. And we we didn't understand that. We didn't understand that's what was gonna happen. We just believed that God wanted us to reach people in our community and make disciples. And by the way, a Christian education for kids is discipling them, amen? So we're obeying two commands right there. Make disciples, educate children in the things of God, in the word of God, and reach the lost and help the lost. Help those in need. We saw that in scripture and people believed we needed that furniture store and now years later it is packed and we have no room for students. Now we didn't understand that but there was a business meeting where people stepped out in faith just like our partner night coming up. People stepped out in faith and said let's do it and it was scary because it was a lot of money. I'm pretty sure we're still paying it down. But you know what? I praise God that we did that. And I praise God that we obey the command to take care of people's needs because over 30 years ago, we outfitted our garage to be a food pantry. Instead of storing stuff, we're storing life to help people in need. That took belief in the word of God and that if we obey, God's gonna provide everything needed to make it happen. Be encouraged. Obey the commands of God's word and as he gets specific on how, because it may be that when God says to take care of someone at a restaurant today, he may whisper, pay for the whole thing and buy a gift card for them for next time. That's how he works. Trust me, I know. But Lord, you see my bank account. <laughs> hey, be good steward, be careful. It's okay. But at the same time, God, he works in ways we do not understand. And he will work. If God prompts it, we move in it. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand together as we pray? I think I said that like 10 minutes ago. Pray. We're going to pray and it's 10 minutes later. We're going to have prayer team members up here at the end because 
I don't want anyone to miss out on getting in the boat, getting in the ark. And so our prayer team members will be down here ready to pray with you and lead you to salvation, lead you to a prayer or to a decision of putting your faith in Christ. And so we want to do that with you and and we're believing that God is going to change your life from this day forward. And there was a note I didn't say earlier, I want to say it now. You don't have to understand everything about Jesus to believe in him. And you don't have to understand everything that Jesus asked to obey him. You don't. I didn't understand everything. It was after my heart was moved to believe in him that I began to read the word and understand more and more. And it was after I stepped out in obedience that I began to understand why God asked me to step out that way. That's childlike faith. And that's the faith that the word of God says, you will see the kingdom of God. You will see heaven. Lord, we are so inspired and encouraged by the faith of everyday men and women in Hebrews 11. And Lord, I pray that you would increase our faith in you. It's not in our own power or ability. Our faith is in you. God, increase it. And Lord, I know that the increase comes when we step out. I know in my life, God, my faith has increased when I obeyed. So Lord, help us to obey your word, to believe your word, and to live it out. And Lord, today... You have been working on hearts to believe in you for salvation, to get into the ark, to get into Christ. Lord, you don't want anyone to perish, but to have everlasting life. God, you wish that no one who's hearing this message right now, hearing these words, you don't wish any of them to go to hell or to be separated from you forever. You wish for them to be with you. You build a relationship with us. God, I pray you would draw them to build a relationship with you today save them, and Lord, may they know how much you have forgiven and loved them. God, give us the faith to do the the hard things, all the things you've called us to do. Not all of them are that easy. I pray, God, you increase our faith for those, and Lord, for the things that you're gonna lead and guide us, you're gonna whisper to us, because there's nothing wrong with that, God. But Lord, I pray you would lead and guide us by your spirit, not our flesh, and that you would lead us to do what you called us to do, to build the kingdom of God and to trust you and obey you. We love you, God. We give you all the glory and praise for this word today. Help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.